So, sorry for stopping right in the middle of the build. Uh, we have to complete the meter build, of course, and there's a lot more to cover. Um, let's take a look at the schematic that I'm building to. I just realized that I hadn't even given you guys a complete schematic, but this is basically what I'm building to. Um, there will be uh, three trim pots and one pot that uh, controls the, the, the set on the SWR. Of course, we have the original meter that, we're, that has some tick marks on it that we're going to be using during the calibration process. Then I will attempt to make a meter face that's identical but has the uh, gradical set up to give us uh, the 300 watt forward, the 30 watt forward, the 30 watt reverse, and then the SWR scale. So uh, let's, uh, let's get back into the build. And I also want to go through some fundamentals of SWR and power meters. So everything was going along very nicely. The VSWR function was working perfectly. Matter of fact, I trust it more than my uh, Daiwa meter. Um, I got the first scale pretty much calibrated, the 0 to 30 watt forward. So I was starting to work on the second scale, the 0 to 300. And when I got up above 100 watts, all of a sudden the uh, Daiwa meter started going crazy and I started to lose the, uh, the match. So I thought maybe the, the load had somehow changed or something. What it turned out to be is uh, the core started heating up, especially the core that goes to ground on the, on the bridge. The one that goes to ground here was heating. So I suspected that I did not have enough inductance. I think I was running 15 turns on the uh, toroid, the Type 75 material. So I looked it up and uh, you know, the impedance wasn't one millihenry, but, you know, it was fairly high. Well, anyway, I've, I've now put 30 turns on the toroids, and that gives me a guaranteed 2.5 millihenries. And let's try that on this. Of course, the ratio is going to change, so my calibration I'm going to have to do over again. But uh, I'm very scared of using this thing on 2200 if I can't get it to work on 6. 30. So that's why I've uh, doubled the number of turns from 15 to 30, and I should have several thousand ohms at 630 meters, and probably over 4,000 ohms at uh, 2200. So let's take a look at the uh, at the circuit. Uh, basically, we have the the main coupled arm here going through, and uh, you can hook the toroid up as shown and there's several other schematics that will show the dots in anti-phase but they just hook it up differently but it, it gives you the same result for the forward and reverse on some of the schematics the reverse is on the other side and so on but just make sure you follow the schematic and get the phasing right on the dots as far as the construction goes uh, the biggest problem for me was figuring out where to put the trim pots I actually mounted two of the trim pots on a small board down here and then one of them is kind of flying in mid-air attached to the uh, rotary switch. It's okay because I have holes cut out in the uh, plate that go on the back which outline uh, 300 watts forward, 30 watts forward, 30 watts reverse and so on. Uh, a couple of standoffs to hold the, uh, uh, the secondary uh, transformer which goes to ground and uh, again, uh, keep leads short. Um, you're going to have 25 turns on these toroids in order to get enough inductance to work at both uh, 2200 and 630 meters. Uh, just keep things short. Here's a couple of protection diodes and the bypass cap on the meter. Uh, rotary switch hooked up. Um, people ask, what about these two toroids? Aren't they too close together? Won't they couple? Yeah, there's probably a little bit of coupling, but toroids are quite good as far as uh, keeping their magnetic energy to themselves and not sharing. Also, there's a little angle here which helps uh, to isolate them. Uh, would I go as far as to put an isolation plate between the two? You could do that, but I don't really think I'm getting bad performance here. 
uh, this seems to work okay. Anyway, just wanted to show you the wiring before we go on to the next section. Before you actually have a new meter face, you have the original one. And uh, the original one had some markings on it that were uh, easy to reference. And I was able to basically line up the different power levels with the lines on that original meter face. And that makes it easier to generate my own meter face that's uh, somewhat calibrated. That's not going to be perfect, but it's going to get you in, in a good spot. For instance, right now if we're going for the 4.4, which is 44 volts, which is 50 watts, we want the thing to be close to 50 watts. And uh, it's not going to be absolutely perfect. Remember, uh, you, once you get the whole thing assembled, you can do the fine tune on the trim pots in the back and uh, set it for the power that you're mostly going to be using. Let's say it's 50 watts, that you'd set the trim pot exactly for 50. Then you check it for 100 and you see if you're anywhere near 100. And uh, that's how you can tell you have a good meter face on your calibration. So as you take the data, you know, with the different watts, this is the 0 to 30 watt scale, 0 to 300 watt scale. You look on the meter that you've got, and this one happens to have some tick marks, and you start to work where your different powers that you're interested in to put on the meter that you're going to design are. And uh, this helps you to design the new face to go on the meter. So you might think I'm crazy, but... Uh, I did not use an illustration program to make the meter face. I actually used good old uh, Photoshop. And uh, it's an inexpensive version of Photoshop. It's Elements. And uh, this is all done in Photoshop. I have done it in an illustration program called Canvas. Uh, but uh, this one was fairly straightforward to handle in Photoshop. And I just did it all by hand. Now when I printed it out, the meter face was one-to-one -one and came out absolutely perfect. I didn't have to uh, do anything to uh, reduce or enlarge the meter face. It fit absolutely perfectly. I just used some contact cement, left the existing aluminum plate that was in there with the original markings. I left it on there and just uh, used contact cement. So, for instance, now let's check the 100 and we're up around 7.8. 07 and of course that's reading up around the 100 on the meter so we know we have a pretty good range between 50 and 100 it's reading quite well and that's what you're checking when you're when you're doing the new dial for the so meter. when you're checking for reverse in this case the 30 watts reverse this one you basically hook the thing up backwards you put it in the reverse set it for the 30 volt level and then see if the thing is actually going to read properly once you turn the meter around. And there it is. Full scale is indeed 30 watts. So that's how you calibrate the, the reverse. Now when you're calibrating uh, the SWR scale, basically you put the transmitter in the lowest power possible. So this seems kind of quick and dirty, but we need to make some test terminations to be able to determine uh, the marks for the SWR on the front of the meter. Now the first thing that I did is I reduced my grid drive until I got my power down around 5 or 10 watts. Something low enough that I'm not going to burn up my resistive loads. If you have to run a fan on them to cool them. This particular load here I've got set up for 100 ohms so it should be a 2 to 1 SWR. And you basically are, uh, you know, you go into the forward position, you make sure that you're, you're towards the top, you know. Make sure that's close. Then you go into reverse, and it should be around 2. So it's not perfect, but it's in the ballpark. So that those two resistors, those are probably 5-watt resistors. They re represent a 10-watt load, um, and that's suitable for, for testing a transmitter at low power. So you're going to be soldering these resistors or, or putting them together like I am for for representations of, you know, 5 to 1, 4 to 1, 2 to 1, 1 1.5 to 1, and so on. I think I used a 500K in there. I should have used a 200K because it adjusts pretty fast. So in reverse with the proper load, of course, nothing is showing at all, right? Forward full scale, perfect 1 to 1 on the other side. Now, most of the time you're using your SWR meter simply to match the antenna. 
uh, or tell you that you've got a problem with the antenna. It's not that you want to know exactly that you're at three to one, but it is handy to have a good scale on the meter. Okay, I've got my uh, my solder fume fan on the load because we're going to be doing a little bit of power testing here. So the meter has a new face on it, and uh, I just want to check out the 50 watt and the 100 watt level. So let's see if we can get 50 watts up there. Okay. There's 50 watts, and up in the top we have 5, and that represents 50. 5 times 5 is 25. 250 divided by 50 is 5. That's 50 watts. Perfect. Notice the uh, Daiwa is just not up for it. Reading about 10 watts. It's 5 times too low uh, with the uh, Diamond Antenna SWR meter. Okay, let's go for 100 watts now. Now 100 watts, remember, is 70.7, .7, so it's going to be 7.07 .07 on the RMS voltmeter. That's pretty close. And we are reading pretty close to 100 on the meter. And again, we're about five times low on the diamond antenna power meter. Okay, we're talking about 150 watts. And up on the meter. Oh yeah, 85, 86. Yep, that's correct. At the end of the video, we're going to have an SWR meter evolution discussion. But I want to explain how the SRUPER works. Let's look at the source. Basically, any source with enough output to be detected by the diode in a test bridge and drive a meter will work as a test generator. An old bench RF generator, or better yet, a DDS, direct digital synthesizer, with a frequency readout, is ideal, of course. But I wanted a simple portable analog job, so I built this little wide range oscillator. It's a simple JFET Hartley oscillator. Uh, it's got a buffer stage here, this is an emitter follower, and an output stage, a 3053, which uh, you know can drive quite a bit of power. Uh, with a patter cap up here, you could use this uh, down on 135, 137 kilohertz on 2200 meter band as well. Um, if you don't have a 3053, try a 2N2222 or two of them in parallel in the output. Let's go to the test bridge. The test bridge itself, very simple device. I've dispensed with the set read switch uh, for simplicity in this diagram. You can build it without that switch as shown for the purpose we're using it for, which is just connecting and disconnecting from the tuner. Uh, you could even dispense with this pot if you have a generator, like a, an old bench generator that has a, a level output or an attenuator built in. As you can see, the meter reads peak voltage at this point right here. Uh, with the output left open, okay, this is open, nothing connected. Um, the meter is driven by the RF voltage between the two 50 ohm resistors, okay, to the left which form a voltage divider, and the voltage right at J2. So it's a shunt detector. It's not a series detector, it's a shunt detector. It's looking for the difference between the RF voltage here and the RF voltage here. That detected voltage is sent down to the meter and that's what drives it. Now let's say we put a, uh, we've got this set for full scale now because there's no load on it and you were getting the full RF voltage between this point and this point detected and driving the meter. We've set the meter to full scale. Now we attach a load at this point. And if that happens to be an identical 50 ohm resistor, then you get a voltage divider between these two resistors and a voltage divider between these two resistors and this point goes to zero, the meter is totally nulled. So that's how the little thing works. So according to the swooper, this ice storm that we had the other night has caused my SWR to go up pretty drastically. Let's see how it looks on my new watt meter that I built. This is a tandem match circuit. 
and it measures forward and reverse power and SWR. Yeah, sure enough, a little over three to one now with the antenna, so it has been mistuned by the ice. We've had a little ice storm here in New England, so the antenna is covered with ice all the way to the top, and I've tried to shake some of it off. It's a little bit tough, I've gotten some down. But uh, it's mistuned the antenna pretty grossly. I'm over a 3 to 1 SWR now. So I've taken the little SWR ridge out here. And of course to power it remotely, I needed a 12 volt source. I didn't have that, but I did have a lithium ion drill battery, you know, for one of those handheld drills. And I know the uh, current drain, so I've got a, a series resistor in line that drops the voltage down to 12 or 13 volts. And uh, this gives me a portable operation. So we've now got to dig this out to get to the coax and attempt to uh, re-resonate it as best I can out here. Well, one good thing, the uh, simple bag I put over the tuning unit seems to have kept it completely dry. High and dry, everything seems happy inside. So let's see if we can get the swooper hooked up. So inside my SWR meter said something like three to one, and the swooper is of course confirming that. We are no longer matched. So I'm going to attempt to, well let's check forward first. Yeah, that's good enough. Okay, so let's just try to re-resonate it with the variometer, see what we can do. Okay, so we've gone quite a ways. <laughs> We're down to about 40, 47, and we were as high as uh, 52, so we've now re-resonated the antenna. Okay, it is covered up again. Now I expect this to drift again when the ice melts off the antenna, and I'll have to come out and adjust it again. Again, this is just the experimental tuning box, and uh, now we know why those guys have the remote tuners, and the, uh, or they run uh, an antenna that doesn't have as high a Q, and make their match purposely a little bit less than normal so that they don't have to adjust the antenna so much. In other words, it might be better to adjust the antenna to 1.5 to 1 or 2 to 1 rather than a perfect match simply because your antenna doesn't need to be tuned as often. You make up the difference with just a little bit more power. Uh, many SWR and power meter circuits are out there. You might remember the old reflectometer uh, this was limited at low frequencies because the coupled arms must be made very long at low frequencies. So the sensitivity can vary widely over large bandwidths. Remember those simple SWR meters of the 1960s? They all use that design. Most modern commercial meters are using Bruins Bridge. This circuit utilizes a wideband transformer approach with a toroid transformer sampling along a short transmission line forming a one-turn link. This bridge does require adjustment of one or more trimmers to be made accurate over a wide frequency range. Lately, a new style of power meter called the Tandem Match, or Sondheimer, sometimes called the Stockton Coupler, has taken over, mainly because identical wideband transformers are readily available and producible now, and there's no trimmer requirement. The loads are identical, low Z, allowing for easy power calibration at the output. It's not really a bridge at all, but more related to the old audio hybrid couplers used in your phone patch and in telephone work. For more information on this interesting circuit, take a look at this link. Be sure to pay particular attention to the phasing dots because the circuit is drawn in many different ways and all of them will work, but not if you mess up the phasing. For a single band like 630 meters, really any of the circuits mentioned would work with very little fuss. But you do need enough initial inductance on the toroid transformers to handle the lower bands with the tandem match. So ordinary 43 or 31 type cores 
become impractical. You'd like to keep a single turn through arm secondary ratio between 20 or 50 to 1. In other words, the single turn goes through as the sense element and you might have 20 to 50 turns on the toroid. Uh, if you get enough turns on there, you will have enough inductance to cover both 2200 meters and 630 meters. This represents two octaves of bandwidth. It's important to use a core with a high AL and high mu value in order to get enough inductance with reasonable number of turns. Reasonable number of turns meaning 15 to 30 turns on the core. Uh, type FT50-75 has an AL of 27 and a mu of 2200 to 3100 depending on the manufacturer. That's a very good option. FT50J with a mu of 3100 is another excellent choice. FT5077 has a mu of around 2000. Any similar core will work. The idea is to have between 1 and 2.5 millihenries of inductance so that you can cover both 2200 meters and end up with a reasonable value many times higher than 50 ohms. On a type 50-75, this turns out to be between 25 and 30 turns. So I'd like to end this with a discussion on EIRP, your effective isotropic radiated power. And there are several ways to handle EIRP. Um, one is to uh, get involved with a lot of math, measure your antenna current, do some calculations on your antenna's uh, total power and uh, ground losses, and you can come up with an estimation. But uh, down here at 472kilohertz.org, um, we have a calculator that they've come up with. This is an antenna simulator for small vertical monopoles. And I think this is a great way to, uh, to do some, you know, first principles type work with your antenna. And I think that this uh, is being acceptable uh, as far as uh, being able to justify your uh, effective radiated power, isotropic radiated power, to any authority that this calculator is, uh, is published and uh, it's supported by uh, some real work that's been put in. Let's, uh, let's try my antenna. My antenna is about 19 meters high and it I guess it falls into the T antenna with multiple top load wires because I have that funny looking uh, spreader thing up there that's kind of like a fan dipole. So we'll put it on that one. Antenna height, I'm going to say uh, 19 meters. Okay, that's about uh, 62, 63 feet. I'm going to say uh, two top load wires because I guess you can count my fan as two wires. Um, the top load length is uh, 9 meters. That's about 30 feet. And for the spacing, we can talk about it. It's going to be probably closer to 0.2 because uh, I'm just going to take the average of uh, the fan width, call that the spacing. Uh, ground loss. I'm definitely in a suburban, forested, obstructed, high loss type of area. Okay, that's it. Then you hit go. And what it says is that uh, my antenna capacitance is about 212 puff. I have a required loading coil of 530 microhenries. Remember I said I was uh, requiring about 480, uh, but I have the center loading coil. So this is pretty darn close, actually. So moving down, we can see that uh, loading coil loss is estimated, a Q of 250. Uh, my loading coil may or may not be that good since I'm using the tuner. Uh, estimated loss of 50 ohms in the ground. Mine's probably worse than that because I only have eight radials, eight or nine radials. 
uh, antenna directivity is basically a vertical dipole type of thing. Uh, they're saying that there might be up to 6 kilovolts of voltage at the top at the full 5 watt EIRP I'm allowed. Um, probably a little less than that because I'm using the center loading coil. And uh, it looks like uh, 162.8 watts um, for hitting that 5 watts EIRP. Now I'm going to assume that's uh, with a lot more radials. <laughs> I don't think I'm that efficient uh, yet. And uh, my transmitter is a very good match for this antenna. We've figured, it out, figured out that it can easily do uh, 150 or 160 watts out full blast. So I think this is a really good uh, estimator. And it gives me an idea of why my antenna is working so well right now. So ends the little 630 meter adventure, and it was an adventure for me. Uh, let's remember it all started with being able to hear signals, specifically the loop antennas that were developed uh, allowed me to start to hear signals on 630 meters, and much lower by the way. I'm picking up signals all the way down to the 20 and 30 kilohertz region now. And that was the impetus that really got me interested in doing something uh, with a transmitter, getting that transmitter on the air, putting up the, the all-important Marconi antenna that uh, allowed me to make contacts, and finally to develop some instruments to be able to work in a band where there's not much out there. Now today, those commercial instruments that you can buy off the shelf, many of them are using the old Brune style single core uh, type watt meter. Why are they still using that circuit after 25 or 30 years of the tandem match being on the scene? And uh, it's very simple. It's already designed. It works. Uh, for the HF band, the part count is very low compared to a full tandem match, especially one that's using modern components with a lot of ICs. Um, they stick with what is selling, and uh, the older style bridges are, and couplers are still selling. Um, what happened is a whole bunch of companies started to build tandem match kits and boards. So that's where we're at now. But just remember, most of them are going to come with type 43 type material cores. So you will have to substitute the type 75 or some other type of ferrite core uh, with the high mu value. And then those will work fine on these lower bands. Hope you've enjoyed this video series on my adventure on 630 meters.